Hello everyone. Welcome to day four of Kahal Week. My name is Ruchika and I am the Deputy Chief Marketing Officer at Project Encephalon. We are so glad you could be with us despite the delays because all of you who are here are in for a treat today. Let me introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Leah Krubritzer. Dr. Leah is a distinguished professor in the Department of Psychology at UC Davis. Her graduate work focused on the evolution of the visual cortex in primates, and she extended her research in Australia to include monotremes and marsupials. She has worked on the brain of over 45 different mammals. Her current research focuses on the impact of early experience and how culture impacts brain development. She also examines the evolution of sensory motor networks involved in manual dexterity, reaching and grasping in mammals. And she has received a prestigious MacArthur Award for her work on evolution. Dr. Leah, we are so glad that you could make it here to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And again, I apologize um, for the mix up. I thought it was going to be two hours later. So here I am. Um, and I'm going to, I think I could share the screen here. Okay. Great. Can everybody see that? Yep. Good. Can yes. you guys hear me? Okay. Yes. Let me get going here then. So guys, thanks again for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and I, 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 at first, I also want to acknowledge, you know, the tragedy that your country's going through. And I really hope, uh, you know, things turn around in, a, in really rapidly. And so just know that, you know, people here in the United States are thinking of you and, and, and really um, feeling horrible about, what, about what's happening. Okay, so but we, we still have call and we're gonna um, talk today about, uh, I wanna talk today about brain evolution. I'm, and also, I wanna also say, I'm really excited that you guys are actually celebrating call week. So there's a, I don't know if you're aware, there's a call club in the United States. I'm a member of the call club. And one of our problems was that getting young people involved in Kahal, so many people, so many young people and young scientists, including graduate students, don't even know who Kahal was um, and have no idea, I think, about the contributions that he's made to science. So it's a real pleasure that, you know, I have a young group of undergraduates who are excited about Kahal and interested in Kahal. Okay, so I'm going to start my talk. I, I hopefully won't talk too long. I try to cut it down a little bit, but I tend to ramble. And if I start talking too fast, somebody just has to cut me off and say, Lee, you're talking way too fast. So, so I, I like to show my first slide of animals um, because for a long time, I just worked on brains. Um, as a graduate student, I would get you know, animals from a laboratory, they would go into an experimental room and I would do electrophysiology or neuroanatomy. And I didn't really think much about the whole animal. Um, when I went to Australia, I had to catch all the animals that I worked on, and I've subsequently caught some of the animals I worked on. And it made me realize that, you know, you can't really study the brain in isolation, um, that there's this whole thing called an animal with a body that has specialized morphology and receptor arrays that is embedded in an environment. Um, and, and that all of those contribute to brain development and to brain evolution. Okay, so um, I particularly look at the neocortex and, and why I study the neocortex, and you guys probably know a lot about the neocortex, the neocortex is a portion of the brain that is involved in really complex behaviors, perception, cognition, language, if you're humans and reading and things like that. Um, it's also the part that's changed most dramatically in mammals in general um, over time compared to things like the spinal cord or the, even this, I would argue the cerebellum, the dorsal thalamus. Um, and so the big question in my laboratory is, um, how do you go from a very small brain of early mammals, maybe 200 million years ago, that had a few cortical fields, and this is a lateral view of a, of a mammal brain, and the different colors indicate different cortical fields, to a really large brain and a large neocortex with multiple interconnected cortical fields capable of generating very, very complex behavior? Okay, let's see. So here's the problem. You cannot study evolution directly, right? The types of changes that we're talking about occur over uh, tens of thousands to millions of years, right? And so, you know, 
what do you do about this? And brains don't fossilize, skulls fossilize. So you can, you, you know, a little bit about the size of the brain and how it's changed in different lineages over time. But you, can't, you don't really know anything about the soft tissue and how it's organized. Um, but we can circumvent this problem. So you can, the way in which you can circumvent this problem is you can take a comparative approach. And so that's what I've done over years. I've looked at the brains, I think of about 45 different mammals. And this allows you to study the products of the process. What has evolution produced? So I can, you know, I'll talk about the kinds of techniques I used. Um, so, so, and, you know, obviously it's good to look at as many brains as you can. If you just look at mice, it's one small example of what evolution has produced, but you try to have a very, very large example of mammals and, and look at a, a, a variety of different lineages, and not just rodents, but primates and carnivores um, and insectivores and so on. The problem is, so when we were doing that, when we we're doing this approach, hold on one second. Hey, Scott, can you close the window? My husband's, I'm, I'm visiting my daughter. I'm not even at my own home. <laughs> I'm in her little garden here. Anyway, so so we're looking at a frozen moment in time. Evolution is a moving picture of life. And so anytime I look at one individual animal brain, I'm just looking at one tiny, one tiny um, frame in that moving picture. You gotta go. Okay, um, the second way that we can circumvent these problems is we can take a developmental approach. So, th so I have those frozen frames, um, and the but the comparative approach doesn't tell me anything about how phenotypic transformations occur. So in order to understand how these differences occur, because I can say, okay, I have, I have like a monkey and I have a, a mouse and I have a squirrel, but th these brains are different. And how do these differences arise? Um, so what we can do is we take a developmental approach because the evolution of the neocortex is actually the evolution of developmental mechanisms that give rise to some aspect of that phenotype. The, the developmental approach allows us to appreciate how phenotypic transformations have occurred. Okay, so what am I comparing within and across lifetimes? I'm comparing functional organization using electrophysiological recording um, techniques, uh, neural response properties, cortical connections, cortical architecture, how does the brain look, um, gene expression, epigenetic marks, lifestyle, um, just that we can do a, a variety of different um, comparisons. <clears throat> and so over the years, I made comparisons in a lot of different species and came up with this nice little cladogram. Um, and and these, this is a bunch of different brains the different colors represent different cortical fields. You don't have to know which cortical fields um, they are. Um, let's see, I've got a chat going here. Everybody understanding me? Okay, um, hold on. And what we see is that there is a common plan of organization. So all, all these species have the blue field, which is primary visual cortex or the red field or a yellow field. Um, um, then, this, But there's a constellation of cortical fields that all species have. and and and. The, what's really powerful about the comparative approach is that prior to the onset of non-invasive imaging in humans, which was, you know, like 30 years ago, we made really strong inferences about what the human brain looked like based on our comparative approach. And in, and in fact, subsequently, you know, we confirmed those inferences and say, yes, indeed, humans do have this constellation of cortical fields. What's also power powerful is that it can tell us about that unknown form. How do I know the common ancestor had this, this common plan of organization? Because all species examined have this pattern of organization, even in the absence of use. So the, the scenario is that it's all been inherited from a common ancestor. The other scenario, which is highly unlikely, is that it's been independently evolved in each of these lineages millions of times okay so so what's really cool is that it, and i said even in the absence of use and this is a really my, one of my favorite examples of a mammal this is modified modified from bronchi's work and this is a blind mole rat so these are the eyes right here but they're microphthalmic they're, the eyes are like the size of a pinhead and skin has grown over the eyes right um yet if you look at the organization of their cortex this is a flattened view of the cortex here's somatosensory cortex, visual cortex, and auditory cortex, you can still identify a V1 architectonically, and V1 still has input from the lateral genic geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. It's just that it's been co-opted by the auditory system. So you have this common plan of organization that you can't get rid of, indicating that there are huge constraints in how you build a cortex, right? Not everything goes. You're saddled with this, and it's probably due to the way the, the constraints imposed by um, how, how genes are deploy, deployed during development. If then, if then, if then you set up these genetic cascades and you, you know, generate some, some cortical phenotype. 
And you can't just pull out like an if really, really early in the piece. I, I'm outside because I don't want to wake anybody up in the house. So I might have to, I might have to go inside and switch, switch gears here. Okay. Okay, so I said there's a common plan of organization that all species have, a cup of coffee, but obviously there are, there are species differences too. And it's really funny because, you know, I, I, there are, there's a part of me that thinks there's nothing new under the sun because you, you know, you see, you see aspects of organization um, in all species. You see that when species change their organization, they change, it changes in very specific ways. So there's serious constraints. So you're like, yeah, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. There's not a lot of variability, but then, uh, then of course you look at a lot of different species brains and you say, my God, there is remarkable diversity given these constraints. Okay. So here's some ways in which um, brains have changed. My first cup of coffee. Hold on guys. Mm. It's too weak. Okay, so this is a flattened macaque uh, brain, and rostral to the left and medials to the top. And this is a mouse brain, and I can see this constellation of cortical fields, um, but I can see that there are lots of differences, right? I mean, so here's visual cortex in blue, here's uh, somatosensory cortex in red, there, and of course, there's an expansion of the cortical sheet. As I noted earlier, there's a major increase in the number of cortical fields. Um, uh, this common plan has changed its relative location. And, and these are not drawn to scale. So if I if I drew these to scale, this mouse, this is the mouse neocortex would fit in a little tiny piece of V1. And if you if a monkey lost that piece of V1, he, he wouldn't even notice a difference in his behavior. So there's a, so so you know all those years of comparative work made me realize that there's a handful of modifications that have been made to the neocortex, not tens of thousands of systems level changes that I've been able to see or anyone else has been able to see. <laughs> But just a, a very small handful of, of, of changes, and um, so this is uh, a this, these squares are meant to um, denote the neocortex, um, and so the, or the cortical sheet. And some of the types of systems level changes that have arisen are changes in the absolute and relative size of the cortical sheet, um, changes in sensory domain allocation, um, and that means the amount of cortex that's devoted to visual processing in blue somatosensory processing shown here in red or auditory processing. And you can have species that have different amounts of cortex devoted to those sensory systems. You can have change in the relative size of cortical fields, additional modules, I don't wanna talk about that. You can have changes in the number of cortical fields and changes in the connections of cortical fields. And what I'm gonna talk about today is changes in sensory domain allocation. Oh, I didn't say this, magnification of behaviorally relevant body parts how much of cortex is devoted to some sensory receptor surface that's really important for an animal. Um, and changes in the connections of cortical fields. And the, the questions are what factors contribute to these systems level changes? What is the time course over which these changes occur? Can they, or do they only occur over long evolutionary timescales or, or there are, can they occur over shorter timescales like within the life of an individual? And importantly, can we induce these modifications in a developing nervous system and generate a phenotype that is consistent with what evolution would produce? So in addition to the comparative um, work that I do, our developmental in our developmental work we tweak the developing nervous system in a way we think evolution is tweaking the developing nervous system and we see we want to see not just a viable outcome but we want to see if we can produce something that is consistent with what what evolution would produce okay so here are my conclusions so if you're like really tired you want to go to bed you're thinking okay i've heard enough she's the talk was all screwed up the timing was all screwed up i'm going to go and have a drink and go to bed here are the conclusions of my talk and then i'm going to give my talk <laughs> the conclusions are that there is no single way in which change occurs in phenotypes over time um, there are multiple mechanisms that generate similar similar phenotypic outcomes i can have an alteration in behavior, the magnification of a behaviorally relevant sensory surface um, that can be due to a, a number of different things and it can, it can occur over, over uh, two different time scales. So any animal is a combination of different factors that contribute to the phenotype at the, the brain, the body, and its behavior. Um, and changes can occur over two time scales. They can occur over the very long time scale of evolution, but they can also occur over a very short time scale within the life of an individual, particularly early in development. Okay, so here's my talk outline. I'm going to give you exam. I'm going to give you examples from the natural world, um, uh, differences in peripheral morphology and use. I'm going to um, talk a little bit about our experimental manipulations in peripheral morphology. Um, then I want to talk about a brand new project that I'm very excited about. That's called Laboratory Rats Gone Wild. 
and I'm not, I, I have another, I had another part of my talk, but I took it out because I think you guys are tired and it'll be, it'll be way too much. Okay, so changes in proof of morphology, and I'm going to show you my very, very favorite example in the whole world. And this is what I went to Australia to study, the duck-billed platypus. I was really excited. I was, had been working on a, a variety of different primates. And I realized if I wanted to really understand this issue of complexity, that I, I, I shouldn't be looking at really, really complex brains like primates. And I, I went to Australia because I wanted to um, look at maybe get some insight into what, what the brains of early, the early mammals look like. Because duck-billed platypus and echidnas are monotremes. They're egg-laying mammals. And their um, ancestors radiated from mammals like 200 million years ago. So I thought, okay, I'm going to get some insight into what early brains looks like. So so I don't know if you know this about a duck-billed platypus. And I had to catch these guys. I just want to say I had to catch these guys. Um, they have stripes on their bill. Let me get my little arrow here. Here, They run, uh, they have stripes of mechanosensory receptors on their bill running in this direction that are interdigitated with, with bands of electrosensory receptors. And when they're doing anything important, um, like uh, mating, navigating, finding prey, they close their eyes, their ears, and their nose. And so there's one big, huge bill moving around, and they literally move around in the water like this, moving around in the water, and they're using that these this really specialized receptor array um, to, to to live their life. And so if you, so what we did is we caught them um, and then we would record from their brain and particularly their neocortex and hundreds of recording sites to look, to look at what their, the, the organization, the overall organization of neocortex looks like. And what I'm going to show you is a cartoon of what we found, but it was based on a lot of, a lot of data collected over, you know, we would have days of mapping. And so this is a flattened view of a of a platypus brain and rostrals to the right and medials to the top. And this is sort of Leah's Prubitzer's platypunculus. Um, this is this blue, light blue field is the primary somatosensory area. And the the red, well, first I'll show you here, this is a tail representation. Here's the hind paw, the fore paw, the body. This huge blue, light blue thing with these red blobs in it is the representation of the bill. And the, the, the blue represents um, mechanosensory. Um, receptors and the red represents electrosensory receptors. So, so the bill takes up about 90% of all of S1, right? So this huge magnification of a behaviorally relevant body part. They have a second representation of the body with a huge representation of the bill and another representation caudally in this dark blue here of the body with the huge representation of the bill. So, so the bill, um, the rep that representation of the bill, that really specialized body part uh, probably takes up about 70% of the entire cortical sheet. So it's really, really um, has a lot of cortical territory. And of course, when you see this, you know, you're like, whoa, um, the questions that you, you ask are to what extent are these differences in the cortex in this extreme morphological specialization due to genes intrinsic to the neocortex, like there's just a, a genetic plan for this huge representation of the bill. Genes associated with development of the body. Again, like I said, a lot of us are very corticocentric or brain, or, or you know, brain centric and don't really think about the body and how it might impact brain organization. Epigenetic influences on the on body morphologies so like gravitational stress can affect bone density, what, what an animal eats can affect um, jaw morphology, for example, sensory stimuli present throughout development, and the use of that particular body part. Okay, so genes intrinsic to the neocortex alter cortical field size. We've known this for a really long time. There's beautiful work by an, a number of developmental neuroscientists. And this happens to be um, relatively recent stuff from Zembrecki et al. And what they did is they, they looked at transcription factors that are involved in cortical aerialization during development or the development of cortical fields early in development and, and their emergence. And one of these is um, EMX2. And it's expressed in a gradient. And what they did is they overexpressed EMX2 in, the, in a mouse and rostrals to the top and medials to the left on these. And so I just want to point out one thing. This is V1 right here. Here's the, the caudal portion of S1. And when they overexpress um, EMX2, they get a substantially larger um, V1. And they measured it. And sure enough, it's bigger. And this is a cartoon down here showing you this. And then they did some optical imaging and they saw that, yeah, the map itself is actually expanded. And so, you know, one of those systems level changes I talked about were changes in the relative size of cortical fields. So obviously genes are involved in these systems level changes that we see. And, and they're probably involved in this long, this long time scale of change. But this is the thing that gets overlooked. There's really nice work by Kritikos and others. And I'm trying to remember the woman's name. I just heard her give a talk. She, she looks at genes 
that are involved in body development and regulation of the body plan. So this is a beautiful comparative example where you're looking at the wing of a bat and the, the paw of a mouse. And, and you say, oh my God, these look so different. I mean, there must be like all kinds of genetic changes that are involved in this. It turns out there, there aren't a lot of genetic changes involved. There are like a handful of things that happen that would transform a, a forepaw into a wing. And so this is a distal, this is the distal limb, this portion right, sorry, this portion right here. Um, these are the digits. Here's digit five, digit four, digit three, digit two, and this is digit one right here. You have these interdigit membranes. It's all very cool. So there are a handful of genes that are involved in that. One of them, one of them is PRX1, and it's involved in the elongation of the of the distal forelimb. Um, and what they they do, they did a comparative study in bats and mouse before, looking at forelimb development. And they found that in middle stages of forelimb development, you had a difference in the spatial location and extent of this PRX1 that could account for this. Thing. Well, so, so like I said, there's a handful of genes that are involved in um, um, inhibiting some some things that occur during limb development or, you know, having like other things occur. But importantly, so you get something like this. It, but look at this. If you go down and you look at the cortex and um, rostral to the left and medial to the top, and you look at the forelimb of a mouse representation, and it's pretty small. It's not really huge. You know, they got a, a huge diversity representation, but not a big forelimb representation. And you, but you look at the forelimb representation of a bat. And it's huge. So you say, so to what extent is this really large magnification of a behaviorally relevant body part? And it is relevant because, you know, it, there, there are specialized receptors on the wings that for, that are uh, capable of detecting really small changes in air pressure. So these these wings are, are really um, important sensory um, apparatus, apparatuses. And so what you see is this huge representation of the, of the wing. And you say, is this due to genes intrinsic to the neocortex? Or is it simply due to genes extrinsic to the neocortex, but intrinsic to the animal that are involved in body development that then manifest as changes in the neocortex? Or is it some combination of both? And so I'm just, so I'm, I showed you, you know, the bat and, and, and the, the platypus, and we see this, you know, huge magnification. And I would contend that all brain, brains follow the same rules of construction and operate under the same constraints. I'm sure you guys have read Ken Catania's work. He has beautiful work on the star nose mole, where you have this huge representation of the, 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 the follicles of the nose, um, the naked mole rat, that a huge representation of the incisors. And we can look at the humans. We can say, well, let's look at the supralaryngeal tract and oral structures that are involved in speech. And if we look at somatosensory and motor and premotor cortex, we have a huge magnification of that. We call it Broca's area as if it's just been plopped on there in humans. But in fact, it's just following the same rules of the construction that we see in all other species. Obviously, there are changes in connectivity, um, um, as there probably are with, with these specializations as well. Okay, so am, is, is, am I going too fast? If I am, somebody tell me and I'll try to slow down if I can. I'm kind of going slow because I haven't had my coffee yet. This is sort of slow for me. Okay, I'm assuming everything. No, it's it's all good. Please, okay, please, okay, please. okay, thanks guys. Because when I, when I teach my undergraduates about 10 minutes through my classes, they always say, slow down, you're going too fast. Okay, here we go. So now that's that's a, some of the or part, the first part of the talk. And now what I want to do is talk about um, experimental manipulations of peripheral morphology. And these are our developmental studies. So what are the, the animal that we, we use is a, a small um, a marsupial, it's called the short-tailed opossum or monodelphus domestica. We have a nice colony of these guys. And the reason we wanna do our developmental manipulations in, in, in monodelphus is because, check it out, look at, this is what they look at. Well, they, it's a couple of reasons. One is they have a relatively small neocortex with very nicely defined cortical fields. So here's V1 right here. This is a flattened cortex, rostral to the right, medials to the top. So here's V1 right here. This is S1 right here, and here's A1. Um, and, and so nicely defined cortical fields. And if you're gonna make a manipulation and try to make one of those systems level changes, you don't wanna use a really complicated brain where people don't agree what the boundaries of the fields are or any of that kind of stuff. So we own this animal. The other thing is, is look at this. This is postnatal day four. This is the state of the animal when it's born. So it's basically born, well, th this is like four days after birth basically born embryonically. So we don't have to do our manip manipulations in utero. We can do them ex utero. So here's a little forelimb right here. They don't even have their hind limbs aren't even formed. The eyes are just a little tiny layer of cells. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, what happens to a, to a cortex if really early in development, we, ch we change the ratio of incoming sensory input. So you can see from up here, visual inputs, a lot of cortex is devoted to visual processing. These are vis highly visual animals. What happens if we bilaterally nucleate, take out the eyes, 
here are the, this is a diagram over here, before the retinal ganglion cells have reached the optic chiasm and before the thal thalamocortical afferents have actually reached the cortex. So the system is not, so the cortex has, has no information about the, the periphery at all from any of the sensory systems. So this is really early. And so, so, so this is what we do. Then we let the animal grow up and we say, okay, let's see what happens. And remember, we're doing nothing to the cortex itself. We're just changing the ratio of incoming sensory input. So the first thing we did was we measured cortical fields and we found that um, V1, this is a bilateral nuclei, this is a normal animal, was decreased in size. And, and how do we know it was V1? We, we looked at it architectonically. You could still identify an architectonic V1. S1 got larger. This is not that different than what we saw in the, the naked mole rat, where even though it didn't have its eyes, um, it still had an architectonically defined V1. And I'll show you the connections. This V1 also had, there was still an LGN, but it was really tiny. And it's, but it's still got LGN still projected to V1. So remember when I said, we, we don't just want to make a viable in, individual in our, in our developmental studies. We want to tweak development in a way that we think is being tweaked by evolution and see if we can produce something that is consistent with what evolution would produce. So looking at the measurement, it's like, okay, yeah, we can't get rid of V1, but we can decrease it in size. And if we look at the functional organization in these animals after they've reached maturity, using electrophysiological recording techniques to make these maps, um, we find something similar to what evolution has produced as well. So here's a normal animal, um, rostrals to the left and medials to the top. And these blue circles are electrode penetrations where neurons responded to visual stimulation. The green are where neurons responded to auditory stimulation and the red is where neurons responded to sensory stimulation. And this is a bilateral nucleate here. And we can see, here's my architectonically defined V1, but all of what would be visual cortex, which is a big swath of cortex back here, um, is now devoted to processing inputs from the somatosensory and auditory system. So it's been co-opted by these remaining sensory systems. Similar to, the, like I said, similar to the blind mole rat. And what's really cool is that if I look at the receptive fields for neurons in this reorganized visual cortex, um, they were predominantly on the snout, the face, the vibrissae, and the head. And limited not, and, and, and hardly any on the other body parts. And so sort of I did this little drawing. So we have this huge representation in reorganized visual cortex of this now what is we think is a really behaviorally relevant body part, which is this the the particularly the vibrissies, the vibrissi and the snout. And I should say, I'm gonna show you some behavioral stuff. These animals whisk and whisking is important. And, and also we have this representation here. And so I would contend this looks a little something like the like the platypus, where you have this huge amount of cortex that's devoted to representing a, an extremely important body part. And so we also put injections into the architectonically defined visual cortex in these bilateral nucleates. And these are the normal connections of V1, and these are the projections of V1 and bilateral nucleates. And you can, the bottom line is that in normal animals, V1 receives input from visual structures of the cortex and the thalamus, and it receives input from multimodal cortex. Here's the cool thing: in bilateral nucleates, you still have some of those. You still have some of those projections from what would have been visual structures of the thalamus and cortex. Um, but you know, so you can't get rid of some of these patterns of connections. Um, but you also have inputs from the somatosensory cortex. I'm like trying to find my arrow here. Where is it? From the somatosensory cortex. Here it is: somatosensory cortex, auditory cortex, auditory cortex, denser connections from multimodal cortex, and you're also getting input from. Um, auditory and somatosensory um, nuclei of the thalamus, right? So you have this full-on change in con connectivity. So one of those systems level changes, I said, you know, large alterations in connections can actually occur within a lifetime. If you do something as simple as change the ratio of, of incoming sensory input. And, but the change is not re restricted to the visual system. Because a lot of times when you're looking, you're doing these sorts of loss of function experiments, you only look at the at the targeted system. You don't look at other, other systems. And so, um, a, a graduate student in my laboratory years ago, actually, um, he looked at the connections of S1, of S1, and here's connections of S1 inside it, and you guys don't have to be neuroanatomists to say, and this is the injection site, and all these little dots are uh, uh, retrogradely labeled cells. And here is a similar connection or similar injection, in, or in a similar occasion, sorry, in bilateral nucleates in S1. And you can see that the pattern of connections of S1 is, of projections is really, really different, right? It's much, much more broad. Okay, so we see here. And, and if you record from neurons in the Vibrissi representation in S1, and this is done by a graduate student of mine, Deepa Rabamurthy, who's doing a postdoc somewhere else now, she found two really cool things. One is that the receptive fields for neurons 
in the Vibrissi representation are smaller and that they have better discriminability. And what that means is that any individual neuron is better able to discriminate uh, stimulation of this whisker compared to the surround, right? So, so you sort of had this, presumably this heightened tactile um, input from the Vibrissi. But what about behavior? So this is stuff we've gotten into in the last five years. And so all of this is really cool, even from a developmental point of view and from an evolutionary point of view that you have these massive changes in cortex. Um, and that's all great, but, but, but behavior is the target of selection. The size of a cortical field is not the target of selection. The connections of a cortical field is not the target of selection. Genes are not the target of selection. They co-vary with the targets of selection, but the real target of selection is behavior and the, the, the you know, visible phenotype of the animal. And so, so I said, you know, so we see this sort of massive expansion of the Vibrissi representation um, in now occupying what would be uh, visual cortex, changes in response properties of neurons, changes in connections of, of this reorganized V1. So what about behavior? And so, as I said before, these animals whisk. This is a sighted um, opossum. And you can see it, it's whisking. This is a bilateral a nucleate, and it's whisking. There's We have a lot of uh, data on this also showing that the, the activity levels of these animals are the same. So you know, in terms of how often they're, they're awake and moving in their cage, it's, it's the same inside it. And, and blind animals. And I want to show you this movie because I think it's super cool. And you know, it's fine to see slides, but movies are always so much more fun. So the red right here is, is marking a bilateral a nucleate, and the blue is going to mark a sighted animal. And this is a series of experiments that we're writing up now where we, we put these animals in a highly enriched environment to see if we can kind of um, even sort of uh, extend this sort of cool somatosensory plasticity and, and amplify it that we see. So what you're going to see though, so this, th here's the nest box up here. The food and bedding is down here. These animals have prehensile tails. So you're going to see it like it's going to be putting sort of nesting material on its tail. But you wait, wait to see how, how amazing it is and how well it navigates these cages. And I should say, we would change the, the configuration of the cage every three days so that the animal it wouldn't be like a spatial memory task. The animal would really have to rely on its sensory systems to navigate, to eat, to find water and do all this kind of stuff. So check this out, this is super cool. Here he, here's this little guy up there. It's, this is sped up. Look, see, he ran down really fast. These guys are really cute. So you can see he's putting little nesting material in his tail, more, more. And what do you see? He's gonna like zoom right back up that branch and go to his nest. Um, and like I said, you would not be able to tell that this animal is, is, is blind, even though under normal circumstances, these are highly visual animals. Pretty cool, huh? Okay. All right. So now I want to, I'm going to show you some more movies too. So I want to show you some of the, the behavioral tests we've done on sighted animals and bilateral nucleates. And these were done by um, Deepa Ravamurthy and a, a graduate student in my lab, um, Mackenzie England. Oh man, there's nothing like a first cup of coffee in the morning. Okay, so what they did is we, we tested them on the variable ladder rung walking task. So what you do is you have this ladder, these are the rungs, and it's suspended um, across, a, I wish you could see it better. It's suspended, um, it's about maybe this long, and there's a starting cage here, and then their home cage is right here. And what's really cool about this task is these animals don't want to be in that starting cage and they want to be in their home cage. So you don't have to spend hours and hours training these animals to walk across this, this ladder. So the ladder is, is it's, it's um, suspended above the floor and it's built sort of in, 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 a, in a plexiglass tube. So the animals aren't going to fall or anything like that, but it gives the appearance that they're, it's very high um, and that they're walking across it. So they walk across it. And when you, you first train the animals to do this, the, the rungs are equidistant. Then what you do, once they, once they get the idea, like, okay, I have to walk across this thing to get to my home cage, um, you change the, you randomly change the distance between the rungs. And you say, okay, how do you do? And so this is really cool. Um, we, I don't know if you guys are doing behavior or, or if you're working in laboratories or, but I'll tell you, there's a new um, machine, learning, uh, machine learning algorithm out there. It's called Deep Lab Cut. And it allows you to take videos of the animal place markers on different body parts that you're interested in and, and look at 
the the kinematics of movement. So up until this point, most behavior you would just score. You would look at the videos and say, did the animal make a mistake? Did it not make a mistake? What was its success rate? This allows you. I'm going to show you a movie. This allows you to do so much more. So the animal's walking across the, the ladder, and we, can, we we marked his limbs and his tail and his nose. And so um, you can look at move, movement movement strategy, and this is just an example of that. So here's what I want to show you. This is a sighted animal. And this paper, uh, this paper got published last year. It's, it's, I think it's a really beautiful paper. Okay, if I do say so myself. <laughs> okay, so um, here's a sighted animal with whiskers walking across, and you can see he slips through, and those would be those would be errors. Okay. Okay, wait to see this. Uh, you know, sometimes here's the deal. You can, you know, you you get your data, you analyze it, you do all your stats, and you know, you're like. Okay, we have a result, but wait, you see, the, this, this is like so awesome. This is a, an early blind animal with its whiskers walking across, and he, they are really good at this. They are much better at this than the sighted animals. And this is even this is the better. This is the best video ever. This is what happens when we trim their whiskers. So remember, they have this huge representation of the whiskers and cortex. They have changes in connectivity of you know of somatosensory cortex and visual cortex. And you have changes in the response properties of neurons um, um, that are receiving input from the whiskers. And this is what happens when you trim the whiskers. They completely fall apart. They change how they walk across it. And so you, you, you can say, okay, this is correlative, but I think those changes in cortex are actually do, doing something for behavior. Okay, and so I know it's, it's fabulous. I know you can, you can applaud because I love, I love, I never get tired of looking at that movie. Okay, let me see. Does anybody have anything in the chat? And I'll then I'll move on. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. Deep lab cut. Yeah, I you guys so you guys know about it. Comes to the rescue on behaviors. Yeah, we and we're doing so much more, so many more cool things with deep lab cut because you can kind of modify it to to analyze things the way you want to analyze things, and it's really it's really awesome. Okay, and so so, so here we go. This is a, and yes, we did stats. We did our scientific duty and did all this stuff. We didn't just say, "Hey, look at these videos." There's really a difference. Um, so this is total. This is percent of error, and this is early blind animals in blue and sighted animals. So the number of errors is really low, uh, much much lower in bilateral nucleates compared to sighted animals. And when you trim when you trim the whiskers, let's see here. When you trim the whiskers. Um, the, the errors increase dramatically, but even more so in, in blind, much more so in, well, not much more, but, but si statistically significantly more so in bilateral nucleates. And you can break out what's, what is the error due to the forepaw, to the hindpaw, blah, 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 blah. Okay. And so here's what's really cool. So, so the, the blind animals um, and, and sighted control animals, they adopt different strategies, but the blind animals their posture changes dramatically when they cross that with their whiskers not trimmed compared to the compared to normal animals. They kind of scrunch up. They don't lift their paws high. Their stride isn't as long. And they engage in it's what's called nose tapping, meaning they're tapping their nose on the, the rungs before they put their paw on it. So they immediately change their strategy. Both animals do. But the whisker trimmed animals, their their um they their uh, kinematics is is much much more conservative it's kind of like if you're walking across a room and somebody turns off a light you you you're, you don't step as fast you don't walk as fast you don't your strides aren't as long so it's really it's really pretty cool okay oh uh, just very quickly here so deepa did a this was a really hard behavioral experiment where um she this is a tactile discrimination task where they were given they were put in a y maze and they had to um, choose between a rough and a and a smooth uh, surface. And what we did is we used different grids of sandpaper. And I'm here to tell you, this is like, this is not fancy schmancy. We built this Y maze. We used sandpaper, went to the hardware store. This experiment didn't cost a lot in terms of putting it together. It took, cost a lot in terms of time. And, and what, and so you train the animals to do this and man, it was really hard to train the animals to do this. And what you find is, so this is differences in sandpaper grit. So if there are no differences in the sandpaper grit, this is accuracy of, uh, of, or, or percent correct. Both blind animals and sighted animals do very, very poorly. Um, if you have large differences in the textures, so like you have a really, really rough sandpaper and no sandpaper and a smooth wall, that's really easy for both animals to do. But as you gradually change the, uh, the differences in sandpaper, so, you know, from really big differences to absolutely no differences, um, and it, you can, you can determine, um, 
how fine of a grit difference these animals can can detect. And so what we find is that across the board, there's a significant difference in our blind animals compared to our sighted controls, where they can detect differences in grit of 25 microns, whereas sighted controls need at least 100 micron difference in grit of sandpaper. So their tactile discrimination is better as well. So that big representation of the whiskers is likely to be doing something. So that's that's cool. Okay, and so and if you trim the whiskers, um, they're both the tact in sighted sighted animals and and um, blind animals, um, the behavior drops to chance, and then over a few days it gets better. Okay. Oh, okay, then she just, this is so cool too. This paper is going to come out in a couple of days, I think. What happens is we're looking at deep lab cut. Here's the animal here. It's not, you can't really see it very well, but we marked the, the base of the tail, each ear and the nose. And when we built this Y maze, we built it, the, the distance between the walls so that the whiskers can just be touching the walls, right? Not, we didn't build them really far apart or really close together. And normally pre-trim, and this is both um, normal and sighted, the animals would navigate the um, maze like this, then afterwards, check this out. This is how they navigated the maze. They had their snout against one wall and their butt against the other wall. And that's how they were doing their sort of detection, walking through the maze and detecting the, the different surfaces. So that's pretty cool. So the end of this little portion is, and I'm almost, I don't have too much more to go. The end of this little, um, the end of this little portion is that blindness is more than an absence of light, right? So it's not like you can say, I'm going to close my eyes and I know what it's like to be blind because you can't, because you have huge differences in co connections of the thalamocortical connections, cortical, cortical. I didn't talk about this and we didn't look at them, but people have, you have differences in subcortical connections. Um, you have differences in your functional organization of your cortex. And so it's, 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 you know, it's not simply all of a sudden you're going to eliminate some source of input. It's, it's your whole brain is wired a bit differently. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about this final portion. Um, and, and this is cool. We call it um, natural variation in movement experience and affordances, laboratory rats gone wild. And I'm going to tell you guys, and I'm going to do a little woohoo dance here. This, we just got this grant funded, so I'm super, super excited about it. And uh, yeah, so this will be me tonight. See this guy right down here? I'm going to be, thank God, I got to tell you guys something too. I, I did take this talk really seriously. I got up yesterday morning at 530 because I thought yesterday was the talk. And, you know, I got online and it's like, no, 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 it's, it's tomorrow. So two, for two mornings in a row, I'm glad I got up early. I got up at 5.30. And um, anyway, so I'm ready to, to have fun tonight. Anyway, so, so, you know, bilateral nucleation is like taking a sledgehammer to the system, right? I mean, that's, that's a really big manipulation. So what happens if you radically change the environment? You're not doing anything to the body itself, but just changing the environment and the affordances the animal has access to. And so we're really lucky. And this is done with Mac and a colleague of mine, Danielle Stolzenberg. Um, so can we really understand spe species typical behavior when an animal is reared in something like this? You know, it's, it's, it's you know, we, we, we go through our, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, look at normal animals, laboratory animals, and then I'm gonna deprive them of something. This whole situation is major deprivation. And so we have access to, um, put, so this is an aerial view of our field pens, Puda Creek Riparian Reserve field pens. Here they are right down here. Here's an aerial view. You can see they're in this nice kind of wildland area. Here's a little blow up of them. They're over 3000 times the size of a laboratory cage. So you can do classic EE, environmental enrichment, and people have done it since the 60s, but those cages are only like two or three times the size of a normal cage. So this is this is it. And they, you know, um, you know this is Dylan who started these projects. So you, you get an idea of how big these cages are. And this is the inside of the cage, although it's not really the inside of the cage. It's the inside of the cage while it's empty. This is a nesting area. But these animals are exposed to a range of environmental conditions, temperatures going from 43 to 12 degrees Celsius, humidity. We had an earthquake out there. They can hear wild predators. They, the wild predators can't get at them. And so what we do is we take pregnant mothers and we put them in the cage. We put them in this cage and we let them give birth. And then the animals are reared out there by the mother. We have to go out there every single day and we do all kinds of behavioral measurements on the young and a whole bunch of different things. And then we let the animals grow up. Um, and and um, and some we're doing, we're, we're looking at actual development of connections and others, we let the animals grow up and look at a variety of different things in cortex. But let me just show you an the, the, the idea of this. So look at these guys. 
you can see that they're using their tails, their hind limbs, they're bracing themselves, even their trunks are being utilized differently than you would in a normal in a, in a normal situation. And just give you an idea. And what's really cool is you can look at play interactions, you can look at nesting behavior. And this is this this is from a while ago. These are preliminary. We're actually doing um, Norwegian brown rats out there now. You get the idea. These animals have affordances um, that that laboratory animals don't have. And and also I should say, the the cages now they have all kinds of different limbs that they can crawl on, different textures, um, a, a variety of different uh, objects that they can inter in, interact with. And we. We also change the we change them around once a week, um, just to kind of make the environment a little more dynamic. So these are cool, and I want to tell you something else too. So, you know, when you start off as a sorry, I have to I'm gonna to have to wipe my I just wiped my nose on my shirt. Oh God, so awful. Okay, so um, you start off as a graduate student, you do all these fun experiments, then you become a postdoc, and you know. Certainly, Australia was really fun. Then you become a, 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 you know, you get your own laboratory, and you know, you're. I won't say it gets less fun, but it kind of does because you have to teach classes, and then you have to do administrative work, and then, then you get to my level, you know, where, you seem like you're you're further and further removed from the science, and you know, you're writing these grants. When we when we started doing these experiments, these experiments made me feel like I was a graduate student again because, I don't care. I don't have any. I don't have any skin in the game. I don't care what the outcome of this is. I, I just I'm just excited to see what the brain's going to look like, right? And even what the behavior is going to look like. And so we, it was really fun is that every single thing we're every single thing we look at is different. So we we're doing some of these you know just general tests like when do they open their eyes? Well, field pen animals open their eyes later than laboratory rats. Um, when do they start to walk? Um, um, they start to walk earlier than laboratory rats. Um, when do they start to surface right? So we're doing a whole battery of tests, and almost everything we look at is different. But here's what we did. We thought, okay, so what's what what systems or what what kind of cortex are we going to look at? Well, we're going to look at somatosensory cortex. We're definitely going to look at visual cortex in in the brown rats. But the first thing we thought was let's do let's look at motor cortex. Let's let's because my guess is motor cortex is going to be different. So for these, we're not doing we're not sticking an electrode in the brain and then recording from neurons. We're sticking a, a stimulating electrode in the brain. We're passing a small current and we're looking at what sorts of body part movements we evoke. And so I'm going to show you maps that look like this. Let me see at least what's the, the chat say here. I'll have to answer that question later. Sorry, guys, I'm, I'll just continue here. And we can open it up for questions. So anyway, OK. So each one of these dots is a stimulation point, and this is a Veroni tessellation that's surrounded in green, and that means when I stimulate it here, I got wrist movement. If I stimulate it in this uh, purple area right up here, I got Fabrissi movements. But what you're going to see is most of these are striped, which means you don't it, motor cortex. We have a number of papers now motor cortex. It's it's not representing individual muscles. It's representing synergies, muscle synergies. Um, um, muscles that are commonly used together um, in some form, of, in some type of behavior. So when I look at the maps of, oops, how, where am I going here? Here's a laboratory animal and here's a field pen animal. And you know, they kind of look the same. What we're seeing is a lot more sort of green over here. What's really interesting is this hind limb tail area here. It's, it's, um, um, you have a lot more just individual hind limb movements here, and we even get tail and you, I think rarely have ever see tail representations in motor cortex of laboratory rats. But I think what's what, what, what the way you really want to look at this is to look at muscle synergies, what muscles are commonly used together. So, for example, here blue is laboratory rats and green is uh, field pen rats. And so if I look at when Vibrissi and forelimb are, I can induce those movements together. Um, laboratory rats have, a, you know, a, percent of movements are pretty high. And these guys are pretty high too. The brissy and hind limb, uh, forelimb and face. What's really cool is just the pure green stuff. That's stuff that we can only elicit in a field pen rat and cannot elicit in a rat laboratory rat. Forelimb and hind limb, forelimb and tail, hind limb and tail. You can see the way these animals are using their body is really different than the way this animal in this cage is using its body. Literally these laboratory um animals are truncated they're just they're just like from the waist up they're just this and never brissy whereas our field pen animals um are, are are much much more when we look at the synergies that are represented in motor cortex okay so and i think a big question here is not just 
you know, how far can I push a phenotype? Can rearing in a highly variable environment alter the ability of an animal to meet a wider range of sensory motor challenges, right? Can, if so, there is probably alterations in the neocortex at the level of the synapse. So think about it. If you think about laboratory animals, I, I'm, I'm assuming it's the same across the world. You know, you have lights on a timer. They go on at the same time every day and off at the same time every day. Um, the temperature is always maintained within a few degrees. They get fed at the same time every day. Their cages get changed the same time every week. And they're in a facility that's highly isolated. So the statistics of their environment are really, really tight. There is no variability. And, 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 and you say, that's great because we want everything controlled. And one of the reasons it was hard to get this grant published was because there was a lack of control of the environment because there was so much variability in the environment. Yet humans live in a highly variable environment. So the idea is like, it's, it's not just, can I change the phenotype, but can I, you know, full scale change behavior because, and, and are, they, are they actually more plastics because they have so much variability um, during development? Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to, and I'm going to do my conclusions here. I, I don't have it. I usually time myself. I hope I haven't like rambled on too far, too, too long. Okay. So what factors contribute to the cortical phenotype genes? Of course, genes contribute to the cortical phenotype. They can contribute to cortical sheet size, cortical field size, cortical connections, peripheral morphology. I think really, really important. They can, they, they probably control cellular mechanisms involved in plasticity, which in turn lets the environment actually change some of these same things. So when I say, um, there, you know, I, the title of this talk was combinatorial creatures. There isn't a single way to change the size of a cortical field. You can, the, you know, the environment can change the size of a cortical field. It can change connections. It can change peripheral morphology. And I gave you examples of the bill of the platypus, the tongue, larynx, and lips of a human. But what about things like social learning, language, and culture? I got a plane flying over his head. And as a scientist, I think these are just all complex patterns of physical stimuli that vary during development within a lifetime and in species throughout the course of evolution. So that, or, or, let's say an early human environment, um, you know, a mother's love is, yeah, yeah, that all sounds great, but it's really just, it's a cadence of a voice, right? It's an auditory stimuli, it's touch, it's temperature, and, and various complex visual stimuli, right? Impinging on that developing brain and doing the same sorts of things that we saw in the bilateral nucleate, right? It's, it's more subtle, but you know, you're just changing this subtly or, 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 or even um, dramatically changing the ratio of incoming sensory inputs to this developing brain. And so this is just a little human evolution history. And so at the top is sort of morphology, what's going on in terms of human morphology and the bottom is environmental social context. So for example, the modern hand has been around for a very long time. I, I, I have 2.5 million years ago, but I think anthropologists are now saying the human hand has been around for a really long, maybe even longer. And, and yet we were just, we were, had really, really primitive tool use 1.5 million years ago. Interestingly, our big, huge brain has been around for about 3 million years. It's, so, the, you know, as we know, so we have this big, huge hand, I mean, we have a normal hand, a, a modern hand and a big, huge brain. And yet we were still doing relatively primitive things with our hands. And I'm gonna, you know, cut to the chase here. The earliest anatomically modern humans have been around for 300,000 years, which means no change in DNA sequence. 300,000 years ago, we were using spears and knives. 70,000 years ago, we were, you know, had still primitive uh, 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 tool use. It's really weird when you think about it. The industrial re revolution occurred less than 300, 300 years ago. And yet we were still doing uh, different things with our hands than we're doing now. And now we have daily and prolonged um, interactions with machines and computers, right? So, so if you believe that all behavior is generated by the brain, and I do believe all behavior is generated by the, the brain, and there have been no changes in DNA sequence for 300,000 years ago, there have to have been brain changes. And those brain changes have been induced um, um, over, uh, over a relatively rapid time scale, right? So if you, if you had Leah Krubitzer, my genome, my, if you had my gene, you know, my genotype, and if you put me in a society 300,000 years ago, I wouldn't be Leah Krubitzer with like a, a loincloth and a spear. I would be a fundamentally different brain. If I were born 50 years ago um, or, or 100 years ago, I would have a fundamentally different brain. I would be a different, I would be a different person because you can, you can induce what appear, you can induce what oftentimes are lo long evolutionary uh, ch changes 
um, over a shorter time scale. And if you think about human culture, we are a really different society today than we were 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago, right? So this, so this, you know, culture has a huge impact on our biological development. And we have, we have groups of brains that decide how we want individual brains to develop. And it's called our educational systems, right? So um, I'll just end with this. We are combinatorial creatures constructed by genes, bodies, behaviors, and environmental contexts. Humans have involved an extraordinary capacity co to construct our neocortex based over the course of a prolonged infancy and childhood, allowing for rapid phenotypic change, even within a single generation. We have remarkable, remarkably uh, fluid brain body interface with the environment, such as tools and machines can extend our embodiment and peripersonal space and expand the loop between our brains, our bodies and the world. And I think this has made us into really unique bio hybrid creatures whose brains adapt and bootstrap themselves with the technologies they have given rise to, and with whom our futures are increasingly entwined. So we are now our technology. You can't just separate our technology from what humans are. It has become a, an integral part of, of, our, of our bodies and, and I would say also our brain development. So with that, I'm gonna end and say, thank you very much. Again, mix up, but it seems to work out okay. I, I, I was actually gonna take a shower, guys. I did brush my teeth. <laughs> I was gonna wear something nicer than my husband's shirt. Okay, so thanks. That's, anybody have any questions? Yeah, we have quite a few questions. Oh, no, um, I can't answer those. I'm only kidding. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, we have uh, first an interesting comment on the last uh, slide that you just showed us. So Arun Kumar says that a language reminds him of an incident in 2019 where he met a guy from the USA doing language studies. And so Arun talked with that guy in English based on his tongue movements that he learned uh, while speaking his mother tongue. So I think that's such a good example of uh, what you said that how culture shapes our um, brains and um, our behaviors. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, I just think about your generation. You guys grew up doing this sort of thing and, 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 and spend a ton of time, even before COVID, a ton of time um, interacting with computers. When I was a child, I didn't spend a ton of time interacting with computers. And to think that that's not going to shape your brain development and your subsequent behavior is crazy, right? Um, and I think that's, and, and it's interesting too, and, but I think that's wonderful because I think too many times you have a, a, an older generation saying, oh, these kids, I don't like their music or they do this. And, and it was so much better back then, right? Or, or make America great again, right? <laughs> you know, it's like, it, it, this is what human culture is. It, 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 it's, and it's the beauty of human culture. And you, know, you can say there are some bad things or good things, but as an evolutionary biologist, there is no absolute right or wrong or good or bad or perfect direction or bad direction. Evolution just happens. I have a t-shirt that says that. <laughs> okay, and uh, on uh, that note, um, Ankush comments that his somatosensory cortex has evolved him to type emails. I'll tell you what, your, your motor cortex is definitely has, has, has developed kind of different because of this kind of, like, okay, when I'm texting, I don't have my phone here. When I'm texting, I'm like doing this. And so many of so my graduate students laugh at me. They're like, oh my God, you look like an old lady. I'm like, I, I just can't, I can't do this. I, you know, um, but I did learn to type. So a keyboard, I did learn to type when I was in high school on a typewriter. Yes, guys, there was a thing that used to be called a typewriter. <laughs> um, but that absolutely is going to change because I learned to type in high school. But if you are learning to use keyboards and cell phones, um, like from the time you can actually use your hands, and I showed you that example of motor cortex in our laboratory rats, then your affordances were different than my affordances when you were growing up, right? All right, uh, so now moving to the questions that we received. Um, in the beginning of your lecture, uh, Radha had asked, uh, what are the basis of choosing the 45 animals that you chose in your study? Okay, so here's the thing. Some of the animals, so when I was in, so when I was in graduate school, when you go to graduate school, and I, I hope a lot of you guys do, um, you're given project. You go to a lab and they work on a certain set of animals. I was really lucky when I went to graduate school. I worked with John Cause. You guys probably know who he is, a really amazing um, neuro, neuroscientist. Um, I, I started working on squirrels because he told me that's what I should do. And then I started working on monkeys and because he had a number of different colonies of monkeys in his laboratories and he gave me a project. And so it was, you know, it was sort of, I didn't choose that, 
but then I, when I started working on these different animals, I realized I was very interested, not in, in, specifically in the visual system, but in the, the evolution of the cortex. So I then chose to go to Australia to work on these monotremes because that's where they were. While I was there, so, so part of it was a choice, but a lot of it, I'm an opportunist. So when I was there, I'm like, oh my God, but Australia has all these cool marsupials. So I started working on them. And then I also worked on megacoropter and bats because I could. I'm currently, uh, so, so, so some of it is, I, I, I worked on dolphin brains because I met a guy at a meeting who, who had access to dolphins and dolphin brains and sent them to me. I've worked on a grizzly bear brain because I gave a talk in at Washington State University and they were working on grizzly bears and I got to hold a baby grizzly bear. That was awesome. And he said, hey, I'm going to be perfusing some of these animals. Do you want a brain? So some of it was chosen and some of it was just opportunistic and saying, absolutely, what are the chances I'm going to be able to look at a, a grizzly bear brain? And, 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 and also, I think it's really important. There are what I don't know how many species of mammals, 5,000 species of mammals or more. Um, and, you know, we, we know about mice and we know about monkeys and we know about, pe you know, macaque monkeys and maybe, maybe humans. And there's this amazing diversity out there that, that, that may be lost forever if humans keep going the way they're going. And so it's also, I think, wonderful to, you know, to see what evolution has produced. So I'm opportunistic and some of it's planned. Okay. Um, Amartya wants to know, in addition to alterations in functional distribution of senses in the cortex, are there any changes in the distribution of thalamocortical projections for yes. different senses? Yes. So, so there are changes in thalamocortical projections and, and I showed them really, really rapidly there. So for example, um, what would have been visual cortex gets input not only from the LGN, which is a visual structure, but from the ventroposterior nucleus, which is normally a, associated with the somatosensory system and from the medial geniculate nucleus, which is normally associated with the auditory system. Um, and I, I, I didn't talk about this, but I'll tell you now. So if you look at, if you look at blind mole rats or anophthalmic mice, they've shown that there are subcortical changes as well. So that the LGN and anophthalmic mice gets input from the inferior colliculus, which is an auditory structure. And I'll say one more thing, and this is a study um, that we did a while ago where we looked at animals, uh, we looked at uh, animals that uh, were, were congenitally deaf, mice that were congenitally deaf. And we looked at the projections of the retina to the thalamus. We saw changes at that level of organization. So I think you have not just changes in cortical cortical connections and thalamocortical connections and subcortical connections, but at the first stage of processing. So what we saw was the retina not only projected to the LGN, it also projected to the medial geniculate nucleus, which is an auditory structure, because the, that auditory structure wasn't getting input from the ear. Okay. Um, Shreisht wants to know what is the temporal scale of neocortical reorganization and how significant of an impact can neuroplasticity induced by enhanced stimulation or reduced stimulation have on the reorganization? Okay. So the first part, what is the temporal scale? You mean the time course over which it can occur? So so I'm assuming that's what he means by that. So the time course over which it can occur. So we've done bilateral enucleations early in development before anything has been hooked up. And so, so you can have that, have it occur over a life, you know, over that lifetime, you see these massive changes. If you make those enucleations later, after the thalamus has reached the cortex and after the eye has reached the thalamus, you don't see that massive reorganization. So there is a temporal window, you know, people call them critical periods over which you can have these massive changes and, and that, but, but I will say, I think it's going to be different for what different things that you're looking at. For example, the lamocortical connections are going to, you know, if, if they're in place, um, that's going to restrict a lot of things, but cortical cortical connections develop later. Um, so, so it, it, it depends on what you're looking at, but obviously the earlier you have this, these changes in, in input, um, the, the more massive the, the types of reorganization you see. And what was the second part of the question? Um, Um, how significant of an impact can neuroplasticity induced by enhanced stimulation or reduced stimulation have on the reorganization? I think it can have a, I think it can have a really big impact. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll answer there. I, I think, I, I, and, and I will say one of the things we're doing with the, um, the monodelphus, and it's the point of, of our 
rats gone wild is to see, you know, what, what is that, you know, let's not change, let's not change anything in the brain. Let's just change the environment. And, and we'll, we're going to call that enhanced stimulation um, because the animal's interacting with the environment and, and it's active sensing, right? And a lot of people are looking at active sensing right now, because up until this point, you would look at stimulation and you would stimulate the animal. And what that doesn't happen, you know, most often, you know, you're actively exploring and actively sensing. So I think that could have a huge impact, you know, and right now, up to this point, we've just been working on animals that aren't really actively sensing at all because they're stuck in a cage and their, their affordances are pretty small. Okay. Okay. Uh, the last question um, that we have time for. Um, so uh, Arun wanted to know that are the are the animals wild rats or were they lab rats that you then put in okay. a... Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, outside. Okay. So here's the thing. They were laboratory rats. That's exactly right. They're laboratory rats that we then put in a cage. But I just, I just wrote a grant and this, I think this is like so cool. We, and, but I have caught wild rats and we've looked at, we've looked at wild caught rats compared to laboratory rats and we see tons of different changes. But this new project that we want to do is we want to catch we want to catch tree squirrels and ground squirrels. They're diurnal. One's arboreal, one's terrestrial. And we want to catch uh, roof rats and terrestrial rats. They all live in Davis and actually look at wild caught animals. Um, two, the rats are nocturnal. The squirrels are diurnal. But each in each group, there's also an arboreal and a terrestrial animal. And then look at motor look at visual cortex and look at motor cortex. And what's really cool is that they all live in Davis. So they, they all share the same environment. They're just out at different times and at different levels, you know, they're active, at, like either in the trees or on the ground. And so we do want to go beyond just um, the laboratory, the, the, the field pens, but really, you know, catch these animals and look at their cortex. So I'm like super excited about this project. Anyway, I know I'm rambling, <laughs> but I think it's okay to be excited about your science because if you're not excited about your science, who's going to be excited about your science? Absolutely. And it's been so great to share in this excitement with you today. Thank yeah. you so much for this talk. Um, and I'd now hand over uh, the meeting to Pranjal. She'll take it from here. Uh, hello. So uh, hello again. Uh, I am Pranjal, current president of Project Encephalon. Thank you, Dr. Leah, for a very exciting talk. Again, apologies for all the mix up and really grateful for giving uh, a time for an unscheduled talk. So thank you so much. At the end of each talk, I tend to acknowledge some members of my team without whom organizing Kahal Week would have been impossible. Today, I'm acknowledging the work of Ankush, Deepak, Susan, and Sachin for providing extraordinary support during the uh, event. I'm also grateful to Scientist Inc., who are the sponsors of the event. Next talk will be tomorrow by Dr. Claude and Dr. Exa. Uh, you can find the agenda on our website. And once again, thank you so much, everyone, for being here.